I'm I'm really concerned about uh, the future because the very thing that you're describing, where there were blogs, there were things for people to go and read, in the U.S., now that the there was the people that decided they were going to rush into the Capitol, break things, push back with the police, a woman got shot, like bad things happened in that space. If you label that as um, uh, sedition or that these people were actually trying to overthrow the government, thinking that they would then install their own government, then looking in all of the places where they were uh, collecting together and getting together and talking would make sense. But if this is a group of people that had like some outside ideas that got whipped up into a frenzy and probably went too far, then increasing the domestic terrorism, like uh, the amount that we're going to do surveillance and check into people and label them, I think is going to have a kickback response in the United States where we're, we, we are going to see the very thing that they're looking for, which right now exists, but in very, very small pockets. So that's not just a US issue. I mean, that's exactly the same here. So I, I, I think that it had got to a point in the Brexit situation, probably in 2019, where if Brexit hadn't been delivered, it would have so alienated people, there could have been some civil unrest. I mean, that's what I was worried about, yeah? I mean, genuinely. That was abated and Brexit has now happened. But Brexit isn't the only game in town and the international consequences of what's happening in America are being felt here. So we all watched on in horror what happened in Capitol Hill. It was a shock to see it. But yes, there is now a row about whether it was a planned coup, uh, an act of terrorist insurrection, or whether, as you say, it was undoubtedly an out of control, unsavory, in my view, completely unhelpful, you know, in intervention. And, and it was out of control, that's true. But you're right. Now we have a situation which I think is very precarious because it's not just happening there, because in the UK, lots of people are shocked by the fact that Twitter removed Donald Trump from his account, uh, regardless of what you think of Donald Trump, even if you suspended him, suspended him for 24 hours, to take him out whilst he's the president of the US, that feels a bit coup-like itself because we now know that the big tech companies are themselves hugely influential. I mean, they are the power brokers and they are not elected or answerable to any of us. And so, when I then hear, you know, the the new administration, uh, but who were legitimately elected, good. But then when they start to use what happened at Capitol Hill in a way that I think can be incredibly illiberal and dangerous and authoritarian in order to deal with Trump voters or anyone who doesn't go along with a particular narrative on Capitol Hill, and you can see that happening. I mean, it's not just the people who were involved in that uh, uh, invasion of Capitol Hill who were being treated as though they're terrorists. Anyone who says they might not be terrorists is treated as though they're a terrorist enabler. And then you get to a situation, as you say, where you also drive these movements underground. You can radicalize them. You, you end up doing, I mean, you explained it better than me. You end up creating such a toxic febrile atmosphere, such a deep sense of resentment. And it doesn't matter what one thinks about Donald Trump. Tens of millions of people voted for him, even when he lost. You know, this is not some minor figure in American politics. This is somebody with a huge popular base. And the way and to thwart somebody that has a huge popular base if that's what you want to do is through the system, through the mechanism that you built long before either of you got there. It, but because if you start monkeying around and making it like, I'm going to change the rules or I'm going to, when we do win and we do get power, we're going to ratchet it up as high as we can. Then that pendulum is just going to swing further and further back. And I don't think society will handle instability. They would rather have a less optimal situation over the long term than they would to have it be chaotic and and not understood. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think in some ways, though, that's one of the reasons why Donald Trump actually didn't win, because he became associated with that chaos. You know, in, in many ways, his, his, his erratic narcissism, regardless of what you think of his policies, was very difficult to stomach, even if you thought some of what he was doing, some people, you know, might have said, well, I, I, I quite like his policies, but my God, I just want a bit of quiet, you know, maybe the Democrats will bring a bit quiet into the world. I actually think that it's a real tragedy for me that, um, first of all, I do think that Donald Trump's reaction to, you know, not having an overall win has been an example of an anti-democratic refusal to give losers consent, which is one of the complaints I had against the Remain establishment, by the way, in the Brexit argument, which was they wouldn't give losers consent. Losers consent is important. I don't mean there should have been no challenge. I don't know that any. term. What does that mean? Losers, Lo losers consent. consent is a, a key part of democracy, which is you accept that you've lost. You know, you accept you, there's an election, you lose, you accept it. Otherwise, you have chaos, don't you? You don't have to change your mind. You just have to say, I accept it. That's what a peaceful transition is. You say, I give losers consent. You know, I, that's what happens. You might bitterly resent it. You might be furious. You might think anything, but you have to accept that. If, like in the UK, when Brexit happened, the establishment refused to give, or huge sections of the establishment refused to give losers consent to Brexit happening, that was what caused the chaos here. And Donald Trump did the same, or Trump supporters did the same in the US more recently. And um, the, 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 the Remainers don't like the comparison I make when I say that they're a bit like, a, you know, Trump was. But I do think that Trump did a huge amount of damage there. However, it does seem to me to be a completely short-sighted and foolish thing for the Democrats to have behaved, you know, in the way they have, because they should then say, right, OK, it's taken a while for him to eventually concede, but he's conceded now. We should just go in calmly and run the country because we won the election. Instead, there feels like a vengeful, punitive attempt at removing any vestige of support for a Donald Trump style of politics. Now, in view of how many people voted for Donald Trump, that seems to me to be a very dangerous strategy because it can only lead to divisiveness, um, suspicion, and a loss of faith in the democratic system. <laughs> Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures.